course your voices in the triumph song. Glory, Lord, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages men and angels sing. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 this afternoon. I was waiting for Brother Peter to try once again to spell the word alone. That's why I was smiling at you there, Brother. <laughs> if you were here for that, uh, he didn't spell it right. <laughs> First Corinthians 16, we're going to spend most of our time this afternoon. And I realize that's not a ton of time, so don't worry. I won't keep you for an extended amount of time this afternoon. But there is a theme, and I don't know if you've picked up on it, that we have been preached at uh, several times. The last uh, three times our pastor uh, was in this pulpit on Sunday after, uh, Sunday mornings, and then Brother Waterloo has been hammering this theme of service, the open door of ministry, the open door of service. And uh, I told pastor uh, that I was going to, uh, to uh, preach a sermon along those lines this afternoon. I finished Nehemiah last week, and uh, this is just sort of an in-between, uh, perhaps what we'll do next, but uh, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and then look at the verse right before that, 1558. Uh, if you know your Bible, you know 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is uh, one of the most exhaustive, if probably not the most exhaustive, ver uh, chapters uh, on the topic of the resurrection of Christ. And so he talks all about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, and he concludes it with that verse that you see on the screen, verse 58, which says, Therefore, my beloved brethren... Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Therefore, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because of everything that he said up to that, that point, be ye steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. There's a, a verse in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 5, and I've often referred to this verse, and it says, The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. And that's a good proverb. It's not just a, a, a proverb, a, an old tale. It's in the Bible. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. It makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if you, if you diligently plan to do something and, and put effort into making uh, something happen, whether it's your spiritual growth, uh, an activity, an event, if you put diligent thought to that, uh, it, it tends to, to cause the event, the growth, whatever it is that you're working towards to be more plenteous, right? And then the thoughts are everyone that is hasty only to want, the, the, the procrastinator. You know, if you ever had to responsibility you were supposed to get ready for and you waited till the last minute and because of it you were heck you were just it was hectic and it was hard to do that so I want to have an underlying theme I want you to think of that verse as we go through what we're going to look at today the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness but we're going to use the apostle Paul and his account in chapter 16 to talk about the importance of looking for open doors Paul, while writing this uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he's going, to, he's going to say one particular phrase, and I, I'm going to assume most of you know what that phrase is, but it's going to stick out in what we're talking about, what the overall theme of serving is. He's going to say something, uh, and I want you to look for it as we read uh, chapter 16, verse 1, is where we'll begin. And about halfway between 1 and 13, you'll find this phrase, so I'll, I'll try and emphasize it, but I'd rather you just catch it thinking about the open doors of service, okay? So chapter 16, verse 1 says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, and I'll just say that you may know the Gentile churches have been, have been commissioned or charged to take an offering for the Jews uh, who were suffering a famine. So this is what this is referring to. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. 
Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Now if Timotheus comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him. He was a young man, remember that? Uh, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me. For I look for him with the brethren. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come uh, unto you with the brethren. But his will was not at all to come at this time. But he will come when he shall have convenient time. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. Let all things be done with charity. And we'll stop there couple of phrases, really, that I hope caught your eye. Verse 9 being one of them. For a great door and effectual is open unto me. That's the mindset that I want to focus on this afternoon in our few minutes together. How was Paul able to notice that? How was he able to see this great door that was open for him that was going to be effectual? You see, don't forget the underlying verse that I also said at the beginning. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness. I want to speak from this passage and focus on that particular verse, verse 9. And I want us to think about some, some principles, if you will, or, or points of, of, uh, that will help us to see and seize opportunities. First of all, I, I would encourage you, and I, I think I've said this before because it's so true, and I hope this applies to you. I encourage you to be amazed, be amazed that God would provide open doors for people like us. Be amazed that God would provide open doors for people like us. You say, well, careful there, Pastor Tricky. What do you mean, people like us? You know, we pay your salary. What is it that you're talking about? <laughs> well, I'll put it nicely. We're dirty, rotten sinners, if you think about it, right? The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That God would use people like us. Be amazed. It's the case with Paul. Paul was amazed. You see, as Christians, when, when we trust Christ as Savior, we have sort of a, an obligatory vision for the future. Do you know what I mean by that? Because we're saved, we then see there is a great need for others to be saved as well. Isn't that your heart's desire, that your loved ones would come to know Christ? If you have family that doesn't know the Lord, you want them to be saved. You want them to trust Christ. You have coworkers that you care about. And then just even, even when you're out and about and and have you ever just stopped and, and, and prayed and wondered and burdened for a soul on the side of the street that's walking? Maybe they look uh, to be uh, distressed or sad, or maybe they're just, they, they look happy and you think, man, I hope they know Christ. I, I want them to be saved. We have this sort of obligatory vision for the future. And a Christian who is motivated and consumed by, by God's love and, and, uh, and his, his plan for their life, they will see the need to, to walk through open doors of opportunities, particularly with the gospel. That was one of the things Pastor talked about this morning. The open door of ministry involves service to others and also uh, sharing the gospel. And then I think he said the third one was sending the light. So that sharing the gospel, we have this obligatory vision, this need to do that. And I hope we never get over the fact that God would be willing to use us to do that, that he would even give open doors to people like us uh, is, is, is something to consider. You know, consider your past oops and your present oops and your future oops. God still desires to use you. And I think uh, Paul had that perspective very well. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, it's a familiar passage of Scripture, verse 12, where Paul says to Timothy, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, Right? For that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before? And he begins to list these things that he was before grace, before his salvation. He was a blasphemer, a persecutor, 
injurious. He says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Faith, mercy, grace, love, ex exceeding abundant. You and I are beneficiaries of that. And I would stand in line with Paul, as I hope you would, to say, wow, I, I never got over the fact that God is willing to use me and provide for me open doors of ministry. I don't deserve it and neither do you. But God, through his grace, through salvation provided in Jesus Christ, is giving us open doors of ministry. And as our pastor said from this pulpit not that long ago, there are many and plenteous opportunities for you to serve. There are doors for you to walk through. In many ways, the men and women of the Corinthian church were like the poster children of dysfunctional church family. If you read through the book of 1 Corinthians, these people are fairly messed up. And there's lots of issues that Paul has to deal with. And uh, it's not something, in spite of that, it's, it's interesting how Paul uh, opens the book of 1 Corinthians. Knowing all these things, turn back a few pages and look at chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Knowing their messes, their problems, and what he's about to address, he still addresses them this way. He says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sophonies, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, not to those who are fighting, who are messed up, who are causing division, called to be saints, he says, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. He says, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. It's a sweet way to address people. And you know what? He is preparing them for opportunities. And the opportunities that they're going to have to walk through, the doors that they're going to have to walk through, are doors of fixing the issues, right? Not every opportunity is necessarily something you sign up for as a ministry of the church. An opportunity is, is a choice you make on a daily basis, it may be that you're getting ready to, to go to work and on your drive to the job site or to the office or whatever it is that, that the Lord has for you in a job that you pray on the drive and say, God, would you help me uh, with the opportunity to talk to someone today? Lord, I, I want to please you uh, as a Christian today. I want to make right de uh, decisions and choices. And you have just asked the Lord for an, an open door of ministry. You've, opened him, you've asked him for an open door of opportunity. It's amazing. Paul continues to say, uh, even in uh, verse 6 of chapter 1, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you came behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I love how he is thanking uh, God for this church, even though they were having all these issues. All of these problems that are going to be presented in the book of 1 Corinthians from that passage we just read to where we open in chapter 16 are all opportunities for service, opportunities for ministry, opportunities to, to do something that's right. And Paul is providing those, and he himself is in the mindset to look for those type of opportunities. This is why he said in verse 9 that a great and effectual door is open unto me. He has high hopes for these men and women and, and how God could use them and provide for them and, and make great headway with them in the days ahead. Now, while we're in the neighborhood, let's just think about that for a second. Paul was clear about all the reasons why God would have had not to use the, the church of Corinth. He was clear about all the reasons God would have not to use him in service. He was clear about those things. All these things that God could, could have said, you know, there's just no, there's no place for you. Uh, you're too far gone. You know, what about you and me? What about you and I? Do you really believe that God has specific ministry doors open for you? Do you really believe that? Pastor said much the same thing this morning, didn't he? He asked us, do you really believe that God has opportunity for you. Did he give you open door of opportunity this past week? Will he give you open door of opportunity in the week ahead? My point is, beloved, that God has divinely appointed opportunities for you. 
He does. This week, he has opportunity for you to do something. Given everything you know about your past and everything you know about your present and everything that you can think about, perhaps your future, and if anything about that is less than pristine and perfect, right, to think that God still provides door for, doors open to us. That's, that's an amazing proof of, of his grace. Think about the argument of the book of 1 Corinthians. Right in the, at the very center of the passage uh, where we're at in 1 Corinthians, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we often refer to this. I don't think Pastor did this morning. Uh, but we often go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when we're dealing with the Lord's Supper. You know, that's in verse 23 of chapter 11. Uh, Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which was also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread, and he gave thanks. He broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Why is he, he bringing something like this up? He talks about the cup. This is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You see, the fact that God would give Paul and would give people like the church of Corinth and people like you and I open doors of ministry, that ought to uh, immediately cause us to, to, to go to the Lord's Supper, to go to what Jesus did on our behalf, the fact that his body was broken for you, his blood was shed for you to provide you forgiveness, thus making you a vessel that can do service for the Lord, that can take advantage of opportunities. Perhaps you would say, well, honestly, Pastor Tricky, I, don't, I didn't seize any doors of, of ministry last week. Uh, I, I don't know that I'll even do it this week because I'm not sure I have the wisdom to go through that door. I'm not sure I have the courage to take that step that I, I really feel the Holy Spirit is pushing me, especially with all this preaching in our church about serving. I, I get it. I'm listening. I've heard three, now the fourth sermon on serving, and I see that there are things I should probably do, but I don't know that I have the strength to do it. Well, you know what? Focus on this. All of this is founded on the transforming power of Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be something you do in your own. 1 Corinthians 15, as I said, is all about the resurrection. It's the most exhaustive passage in Scripture dealing with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're not going to review it for sake of time, but that might be a good assignment for you this week, is just to spend a couple of hours in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and study the resurrection power of Christ. It's important uh, to see that Paul precedes this discussion about a great effectual door of opportunity, he precedes it, talking about the resurrection, and right before chapter 16 says the verse we opened with, <clears throat> Therefore be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see, it's not something that you can do on your own. You have to be in the, you have to trust the Lord to do these things. By going through doors, looking for the doors, seeing them, seizing them. I hope we're all amazed that we could ever even get to this place to be considered for open doors of service for the Lord. Be humbled by that thought. Be amazed by it. Then be encouraged also that walking through open doors can lead to a life of effectiveness. Nobody likes to feel ineffective, right? We like to have a purpose. We like to have the satisfaction of accomplishment. We, have to, uh, to, we, we like to have that, that sense of duty. We can be encouraged that, that walking through open doors can lead to a life of effectiveness. Whatever your struggles are, walking through an open door of ministry can help you be more productive. You know, it can help you to, to, uh, to, to matter for Christ. Maybe you str struggle with laziness. Uh, you know, who doesn't want to, to sit back and, and watch movies and eat popcorn all day? You know, that's, maybe you're not wanting to, you just, you have a, a sense of laziness or procrastination. Well, how do you fight that? Well, you look for open doors of opportunity. You say, Lord, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to not accomplish something for you today. Lord, would you provide for me an open door? Maybe, maybe you're single and you want something for, to do for the Lord and there's someone in the church, maybe they're new. And, and maybe the Lord, you say, Lord, I'm going to go to that person and invite them to come with me and my, my crew for lunch. I'm going to get to know them. You're looking for open doors of opportunity. Maybe you're, on, like I said earlier, on your way to work. Pray about opportunities uh, to speak with someone. You know what? 
pray that the Lord would use you at your job site. And it just so happens that maybe when you're in the break room and you're taking a break, that there's one other person in there. And that person decides to confide in you that their parents, they just got a, a bad medical diagnosis. And because you've prayed and you've prepared, you say, you know what, can I, can I pray with you right now? Would that be okay? I really, I, I believe in God and I believe he has the power to heal and to save. And who, who knows where that can go? But because you're prepared and you're looking for an open door, I guarantee you're going to go to bed that night feeling like you've accomplished something for the Lord. You had an opportunity to do something for him. You didn't just laze around all day or you, you didn't, uh, didn't take advantage of the opportunity to encourage. And you know, the bookend of that, of course, is at the end of that verse 58. Therefore, you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You're not doing it for anybody but the Lord. It's not in vain. It makes a difference, it matters, it accomplishes something. So we can be encouraged that walking through open doors causes our life to be more effective. Notice this also from the text. This really did characterize the way the Apostle Paul lived. I mean, why was Paul able to recognize this opportunity that was presenting itself in Ephesus? Why was he able to do that? Well, the answer is, at least in part, because that's just the way Paul lived his life. He was always looking for open doors of opportunity. And he actually uses those, that phrase more than once. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 27, he, uh, Paul here says, or in the book, in Acts chapter 14 says, And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. That's the way the Apostle Paul presented that to the Jewish church as well. Later in the book of Corinthians, again, in verse 12 of the chapter, I, I can't remember if it's 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians, but verse 12 says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, and I had no rest in my spirit. I love that line. You know, he, he, he had no rest in his spirit. There's this open door. He wasn't, he wasn't settled to just to not be doing something for God. I had no rest in my spirit. When's the last time that you saw an open door of opportunity for God that fired you up so much that between the time you saw it and the time you seized it, you had no rest for your spirit because you knew a job needed to be done? He even prayed about that when he was in jail. Colossians chapter 4 in verse 3. Now, how would you pray if you were in bonds, if you were in jail? Paul says, in Colossians 4, 3, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in bonds. <laughs> He's a, I, I'm in jail, but I'm praying that God will open me <clears throat> a door of utterance. Don't you love that? Not some lame uh, pray for me that I can get out of prison or pray that the government will change and that this won't be illegal. None of that. None of that. I'm sure he desired that to be the case, but he said, <clears throat> I'm looking for open doors even while I'm here in prison. We have a few examples of prison conversions, don't we? Remember Paul and Silas? Remember the Philippian jailer? Isn't that great? Those stories are great because that's what they're concerned about. They're constantly lurking, lurking, <clears throat> looking for open doors of opportunity. Now, just to be certain that I'm practicing full disclosure, I did read it. But he saw that in verse 9, didn't you? <clears throat> for a great door, back in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. There are many adversaries. Paul was not intimidated by opposition, which is a good thing. In fact, one might even, you could easily make the argument that he flourished, he seemed to flourish off opposition. Uh, perhaps it's because he realized that the thing that Satan fought the most is the thing that was most effective for Christ. So maybe that opposition was just to him proof or, or some sort of, of solidification that what he was doing was the right thing because there were, there were adversaries. G. Campbell Morgan, he, he, he said this all the time. He said, if you have no opposition at the place that you serve, you're serving in the wrong place. <laughs> that makes sense, right? Well, it doesn't mean that everything we have to do is fought against. But folks, there ought to be some opposition. There ought to be people who, who, who are against what you say, uh, what the Bible says, and what you're doing. You know, maybe you, we, we, had, we had opposition this week. Uh, we, we got a phone call and a voicemail, uh, and, and some there, I won't say the name or the place, 
uh, but a particular business uh, in our surrounding area received one of our brochures in the bathroom. And uh, this was, we, we got a, basically a cease and desist call uh, from, the, from not the owner, but uh, someone at that business saying this is private property and, and we're not allowed to do that. You know, that's, a, that's an adversary, that's an opposition. And I'm not sure, are, are we not allowed to do that? I mean, who knows what goes on in the bathroom, but apparently this happens many times. There's, there's been many instances where this brochure was left uh, in, the, in the restroom at their, at their place. There are, it's going to be opposition, folks. And we ought to just continue to serve the Lord in spite of it. There are many adversaries, but there's a great and effectual door open unto you. And God is the one who will see you through that. Paul was not intimidated by the opposition. We all understand that if there is a, a bit of adversarial aspect to an open door, that doesn't mean we shouldn't walk through it. But that does often stop us, doesn't it? I don't want to deal with the opposition, to be quite honest. I don't want to deal with the, the criticism. You know, it is part of following the Lord. And, and there ought to be some opposition to what you're doing for the Lord, not from, from God, but from, from the world. They, they may oppose you. And you can still speak the truth in love. And I will say this, Christians, be careful to speak the truth in love. We're not, we're not hateful. We're not uh, forceful. We're speaking the truth in love. We're doing it out of love. Look at that person who may be adversarial or opposing you as a soul that really doesn't see the truth, and they need the truth. They need the same grace that was shown to you. Boy, it's great to see that. It's a great to say, if you will, that, that sin levels the playing field for everyone. For all have sinned. We all are on that playing field. All of us, those that are saved and those who are not, for all have sinned. I'd encourage you, pray for Pastor and I. Right now, we're working on a list of open doors of opportunities. We have ideas and things that we'd like to see done in the church, ideas that some of you have brought to us uh, or that we have heard that, that, that would be good for us to do as a church. Well, pray for us. Pray that that is something that will come to fruition. A lot of times what happens is we, as Christians, we sort of yakety-yak about opening door, the open opportunities and planning, but then it just never comes to fruition. Isn't that frustrating when that happens? We need to walk through open doors. You say, well, it's not convenient. Well, who cares? You say, well, I'm not sure I want to do it. Uh, you know what? The question should be this. Is it an open door of service for God? And if it is, then I'm all over it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to follow him. I realize you might say the reason I don't want to go through an open door is because people will mock me or people are going to ridicule me and I'm not sure I want to pay that price. Well, you know what? Paul said it this way. He said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believe it, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. One of the questions we all have to ask is, what is it that hinders us? What is it that hinders you from seeing and seizing effective doors of service? And if you would say this is not part of the way you live, uh, I would encourage you before God to ask yourself, why not? Why am I not walking through these doors? Is it doubt? Is it callousness? Is it selfishness? What would prevent you and what would prevent us from doing a better job of going through the doors? I know, surely you've got to be thinking about it. These, if you've been in our church for the last month, you have to be thinking about, man, how do I get involved? Or maybe you've even seen an opportunity. Maybe you've even said, oh, man, I need to, I need to serve. I, I want to do something. I just don't know what it, what it is. I'm excited about this stuff that that pastor handed out to us this morning. I didn't even know about this. There's something he came up with, and I saw that. I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, do that. Fill that out. Uh, this is probably not a, a conclusive findings, but this is just a guide, right? Uh, go through there, look, and answer those questions, and, and pray about it, and see if God will show you more specifically perhaps an area you're gifted. You know, I'll say this, as some of you are in here, but I've had three people, three people talk about uh, the bread downstairs and maybe having that more organized and, and more ready. I love that idea. You know, we have maybe 10, 20 ideas like that of different things that we could do at the church. Let's, let's do those things. Let's look for those opportunities and, and push ahead. And maybe when you fill this out and maybe when you answer those questions and pray about it, it's just like Pastor said this morning. He said, you know, if the pastor, if someone up comes to you and says, man, you're so good at this, you did such a great job, maybe that's the Holy Spirit confirming uh, something in you to do. Maybe he's saying, you know, I want you to do that. I want you to serve in that way. 
Aren't you glad that God gives us open doors to walk through? Aren't you glad that if we want to, we can see them and we can seize them together? You're not alone. You know, that's, that's, that's the final point of what I want to say today. When the open door presents itself, it is a team effort. We get to do it together. Isn't that great? None of us are expected to do everything. There's that old adage, and I think Pastor even said it this morning, that, that 10% of the people do all the work. Sometimes that's the case, but it does not have to be. It doesn't have to be, and it's not always the case here. Occasionally it can be that, but it's not always. In fact, I have found that if I ask, if I come to you and ask that you're more than willing to help, and I'm grateful for that, and I appreciate that, but it is a team effort. We don't have to do this alone, right? We can do it together. Now, now don't think, now don't let this come in. Don't let this creep in your mind. Oh, good, it's a team effort. You know, I, don't have to, I don't have to put myself out there. I'll just sort of slip in the background and I'll serve. Don't do that. No, take the lead. Take the lead if you can. Help out. Lead by example. Let's seek and let's seize wide open doors of effectual ministry. There's lots of things around here that can be done, folks. But you know what? You're not here every day, seven days a week. I basically am live next door, but you're not. The open doors of opportunity are not, are not restricted to just here, just the church. Wherever you live your lives, wherever you work, wherever you serve, whoever your, your, your people are during the week, those are your open doors of ministry opportunity. Please don't think I'm up here upset with, the, with people because they're not serving here. No, I want you to serve where you're at. Sure, I want you to serve here too. There's lots of things to do, and we're working on that list, but take advantage of the open door where you're at and ask God how he might use you. You know what? Someone in your life tomorrow is probably waiting to hear the gospel probably doesn't know, and you can prepare to walk through that door even when you go home tonight or even when you wake up in the morning. You can pray, go before the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Help me to, to, to be brave enough to walk through that door. You don't have to run to their face and scream Jesus. Just run over to them and say, hey, uh, how you doing? How's it going? I had a great weekend. I actually went to church, and man, I just I love what God's doing in my life. Maybe that'll spark the interest. You know, Maybe, that will, maybe that'll do something that will, will cause someone to ask about uh, Jesus, and you have an opportunity to witness to them. Let's seek and seize those opportunities to go through the open door. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you. I, I just, as, as I get older, as times seem to be getting worse in the world in which we live, I just feel stronger and stronger about the need to do more and more. Lord, you know in that when I'm praying to you, I often ask for a, an eternal perspective. Lord, one that will will help me to, to view the days that I live in light of eternity. Because you've said this, this is just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And I often think, what am I doing with that vapor compared to eternity? I don't have much time to invest in it. The time we have to invest in eternity is now. Would you help us to do that? Lord, perhaps there is uh, someone... In, in the midst of us today who you have pricked their heart about, about reaching out with the gospel to someone. Lord, pray you give them the courage to do that. Lord, maybe there's a, an area of service in our church. Lord, would you give courage to, to, to allow them to come forward and say, hey, I want to help here. I want to serve here. I want to do this. I want to matter for Christ. I want to make a difference and, and help us to grow. Lord, we do realize scripturally that your work is primarily done through the local church. So help us be a local church that provides those ministry opportunities to grow in a great and mighty way. We thank you for our time together in your word today. Lord, pray that as we go our separate ways, we'd be thinking of these things and be mindful of how to serve you. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I'll just remind you, if you signed up for the Man, man Up